I have a theory that playing enough difficult games will elicit one of two responses from the player. Either controllers are thrown across the room and keyboards smash with alarming frequency, at which point you can probably make the correlation between difficult video games and this quivering mass of rage that society has to deal with now, or maybe playing through a hard video game teaches... Patience. You stick by it, you learn from your mistakes, and you plow on in the knowledge that the eventual victory will feel amazing. If you're lucky, the game might even ease up on you, but don't count on it. You have to assume that even the hardest video games around have moments of levity in them, because the way in which you design difficulty is like a nice sloping graph. You start off low, kind of calm, and then you gradually work up some ridiculous finale at the end. Unless, of course, you're making a hard game in which it can start off kinda high, and maybe if you're lucky it will come down at some point. I once made a video about difficulty spikes, which is where there's this sudden rise in challenge that the player can't prepare for and often gets stuck at. This video is more or less the opposite, but specifically for hard video games. You usually get a sense for a game's difficulty after a while, but suddenly something's really easy. Not through glitches, but maybe exploits. Hey, if you can make a hard boss easier by finding an alternative method of defeating it, I applaud the creativity. We all need more creativity in our lives. Taking a trip to Germany for Gamescom this year allowed me to experience a bunch of games I didn't have a chance to play up until then. Sea of Thieves was pretty fun, Metal Gear Survive made me want to lock myself in a dark room and sob until the heat death of the universe, and Cuphead I didn't like all that much. I mean, I had been looking forward to it for a while before, but in the 20 minute demo I played, the game failed to click with me. It's a bullet hell game, except your character feels the effect of gravity most of the time, so it's really hard to stay out of trouble when the screen is filled with things to avoid, something that is eminently obvious in a short demo since you haven't got enough time to get used to the mechanics. But hey, give a man more than 20 minutes to understand how everything fits together and he'll probably come to the conclusion that Cuphead is an incredible game with outstanding visuals and a very respectful stance on difficulty. The game's simple and it's all about pattern recognition, so jump, shoot and try not to die too many times. There are levels that employ this type of challenge, but I'm fairly certain that everyone is way more interested in the standalone boss fights, where Cuphead's visual design works wonders with these kind of trials. It is difficult, but not unreasonably so most of the time. The boss I found the hardest before the end game was this stupid bee with her magical triangles and bullet bills and FUCK YOU I'M A PLANE! You've been here for over an hour now and your souffle has collapsed, so fuck you! It wasn't my favourite fight in the game, but shortly after I found this rat called Werner Vermin and he was pretty alright. Actually, he was pretty easy, truth be told, especially when comparing him to every other boss in the third area. He's a rat who hangs out in a tin can and spends his time launching bombs and fireworks and bottle caps at you, but since 90% of these attacks are heavily telegraphed, staying that way even when he gets eaten by a cat in the final form, you learn how to avoid them very quickly. Never mind that you fight Werner Vermin relatively late in the game where you'll likely have all manner of upgrades and experience of some of the bullshit bosses from earlier, but I only died once or twice to him. Though I wouldn't say this is a bad thing because sometimes you need a fight or two to convince you that you might be good at Cuphead after all. There's plenty of evidence to the contrary. I don't think it's a good idea for me to focus on the first bosses of hard games because even with games that are meant to be challenging, they tend to ease you in gradually so that you don't run off screaming as soon as they introduce anything complicated. This is something that the Dark Souls games are very good at, and that's a good thing because there's lots of moments in those games where you might run off screaming. Even better, Dark Souls and the other games in the Soulsborne franchise are very good at building the player's confidence as quickly as possible. The first bosses in these games tend to be huge, massive hulking behemoths that emanate a real air of intimidation, but their huge size means that you can typically see their attacks coming from the moon, so all you need to do is to pick your moments and do a lot of dodging. It's easy enough. It's only when they start throwing more technical bosses at you who don't announce their attacks or where you have to fight multiple opponents at once that the Soulsborne reputation starts to take shape. You start off easy, 
then you make things ridiculous. And yet, anyone who's played the first Dark Souls game will be able to tell you the legend of Pinwheel, a boss that flies in the face of how you'd expect a fight in one of these games to go, and not in a good way. Well, maybe if you've been struggling up until you reach the catacombs, Pinwheel might serve as a means of re-energizing you so you can continue on in high spirits. But it achieves this by shooting slow-moving fireballs at you and being made of glass. Because Dark Souls is kind of open, you can choose to go to the catacombs quite early on in the game, or you can leave fighting Pinwheel until later on, at which point you'll be way stronger and knock him out in three or four hits. Unfortunately, most people playing Dark Souls leave it until later for the sake of convenience, since you'll naturally end up back here anyway. And so Pinwheel accidentally becomes a joke boss with no hope of leaving a scratch on you. Really, everyone kills him so quickly that you gotta wonder if he does something else later in the fight. I reckon he starts explaining how to make money on a video game without filling it with loot boxes. We all have much to learn. I find it hard to recommend the older Legend of Zelda games. A Link to the Past is still a very solid entry into the franchise, but both of the games released on the NES have aged like milk left in the back of a car on a summer's day. Like, I'm sure they were really good at some point in history, but many years have passed since then, and what Zelda 1 and 2 tried to do has been surpassed many times over. Not to say that they don't have redeemable qualities. Zelda 1 was an open-world Zelda game 31 years before Breath of the Wild, and Zelda 2 is kind kind of enjoyably difficult if you're willing to stick with it. Which is kinda hard when Death Mountain is such an aggressive asshole at an early stage in the game, but I've seen worse, I reckon I'll be alright. Besides, Death Mountain is just the prelude to the Great Palace at the end of the game, where Zelda 2 tires of foreplay and throws you into a dungeon full of the hardest enemies in the game, most of which will cause you more problems than some of the earlier boss fights. Especially these fuckers who leap all over the place, fire sword beams at you, and are actually called Fockers. Waiting for you at the end is the Thunderbird, who needs a special spell to be cast on him in order for him to be vulnerable, and is generally a bitch to fight. But nowhere near as bad as Dark Link after this. This guy can copy all of Link's abilities and will overpower you so very easily if you're not prepared for it. Though, the one thing he can't do is sit in a corner and spam the attack button, which is a really easy way of defeating him. Put it down to the standard of enemy AI in 1987, or Dark Link being really afraid of some guy hiding in a corner with his sword out, but this exploit shuts down Zelda 2's final boss without any discussion. That's why Dark Link is so hard in Ocarina of Time. Do you see any corners? I don't see any corners! I mentioned at the start that I'd be including boss fights that become easier through the use of exploits and not because of glitches, and I make that distinction based on glitches being a fault in the game's code, and exploits being the unusual application of working features in unintended ways to some kind of benefit, and exploiting AI isn't really a glitch. Mankind's dominion over machines is what makes us human, and I'm not gonna give that up. Carrying over difficulty from levels into boss fights isn't actually that easy at all. You usually achieve the difficulty in levels by having stage hazards and an abundance of enemies to impede your progress, with the boss fight at the end being an extension of one or maybe both of these aspects. The question is how far do you go? Maybe a developer is really adept at making levels that challenge the dexterity and reaction times of the player, but can't quite carry these over to an encounter with an end of stage boss. Super Meat Boy gets by through frequently combining the standard navigation of levels with the boss chasing you through the stage, putting enough pressure on you so you make mistakes. These work really well, partly because they're simply extensions of regular stages, but mostly because they're not the fucking game of Simon Says you get at the end of Chapter 4. There's no way around Little Horn besides memorizing the pattern. This guy's called Little Horn, by the way. But interestingly, the boss after this can be very simple indeed. When Super Meat Boy tries to do something other than a boss chasing you through a level full of hazards, the difficulty is all over the place, which is surprising, because the rest of the game has a very smooth difficulty progression, which gets kind of ridiculous at the end. But Little Horn is unpredictable and kind of impossible without dying a bunch of times to learn the pattern. Meanwhile, Larry's Lament is really easy. 
I feel like this is another great opportunity to explain the difference between a glitch and an exploit. I don't want to ram it down your throats, but I'm sure if I don't address what I perceive to be the difference between the two, it'll be the only thing that the comment section talks about until the end of time. Larry's Lament sees you fight three giant maggots and try to coax them into jumping at the saw blades on each side. The challenge comes from avoiding both the random places on the ground where the Larry's can leap out of, and the smaller maggots they shoot at you after you've killed one of them. So you spend your time leaping around, hoping that their AI will go for you when you're near a saw blade, or you can just jump through the blades on the left-hand side and just sit there. The only thing you have to worry about is the occasional maggot that might fly along that path, but other than that, the Larrys can't do anything to you. So yeah, it's an exploit and not a glitch. You're not clipping through walls or anything, you're just taking advantage of two objects not being as close together as they should be. Even when you fight in the normal way, Larry's Lament isn't that hard, which just makes me wish that this exploit was available on a different boss fight. I'd rather hide behind saw blades than do this shit again. When looking at some of the hardest games of all time, most of them are a part of this group because they know how to keep the difficulty consistent. Look at Battletoads, for example. The levels cruelly punish mistakes or any lapses in concentration, and then you get to the end expecting some respite, only to be greeted by a boss fight that kicks the shit out of you as well. When a developer gets into the mindset of making a game as hard as is fair, they're not likely to ease up for a big challenge at the end of every level. Unless you're making the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game in 1989, in which case all bets are off. This game is Konami's fault. That explains so much. Like how enemies are always respawning, or how Raphael has these useless sighs with the range of a restrained toddler, or how the DOS version of this game is literally impossible to beat without cheating because this gap was made too large to jump. But seriously, I'm kind of alright with this game. Yes, it's hard, but only cheap in a few areas like the dam level, which combines precise swimming, I guess, with a time limit and loads of ways to take a bunch of damage. But you push through valiantly, swatting away everything that this game throws at you, including the last level where they throw everything at you and expect you to cope, only to come up against the final boss and... Oh, 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 oh no. I have many questions, but my primary question, and the one I'm going to focus on above all others, is WHY?! Kind of reminds me of Dark Link, but a thousand times more underwhelming. You fight through all of this death and destruction, expecting something impossible to cap it all off, but instead you get an insultingly easy confrontation with Shredder where he barely puts up any resistance. It is so easy to get him stuck in this loop where you can guarantee free hits on him every time he tries to jump to this top platform, but even if you don't, he hasn't really got anything even remotely comparable to the stage you've just negotiated before this. And that's kind of weird considering that there were other boss fights in this game that asked a lot more from you. Bring back this giant robot and put him at the top instead. He fucking deserves it. This is Rabbit Luigi, and for many kids in the late 1980s, beating Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was the unattainable dream. But if you could get there, your reward was two short paragraphs where Master Splinter becomes human, and April wants to celebrate with pizza, and I'm trying to work out if that's a good ending or not. Maybe the reward you feel for beating a hard game is all you need. And maybe I need a bit more so that I don't feel incredibly empty inside. Have you got an idea that you'd like me to turn into a countdown? Let me know in a comment down below and make sure you check out my Twitter or I'll be turning the best submissions into a poll where you can then decide the best topic. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.